Hello, and welcome to Author's Voice, a virtual book signing network. I'm Libby Heldon, and I am your host for Solved, where we talk mysteries and thrillers and other uh, wonderful stories that you will not want to miss. And today, we have a kind of different setup. Uh, my guest is Renee Rosen, a Chicagoan who writes recent history, well, more than recent history. She's written four wonderful books, all set in and around Chicago. Her recent, her most recent one just came out, and it's called Windy City Blues, which has a very special place in my heart because I love the blues. So she's going to talk about her book, and then I'm going to talk about my recent book, which is also a historical and is also set in Chicago, and it's called War, Spies, and Bobby Socks. So this should be kind of a fun conversation, at least I hope it is for you. And I hope that you will use the button on your player to submit a question to Renee or to me, and we will do our best to answer them live. Um, and include your name on that question so we can um, call you out by name and be a little more personally. And feel free to order one of our books um, which will be signed right now. Click the button below the screen and we will sign it right here after our show in our studio. So welcome, Renee. Oh, thanks. It's, it's good, good to be here. It's good to see you. Yeah. Um, I had not realized how similar our new books are to each other. I mean, they're both relatively recent history, although for me it's probably uh, longer longer in the past than I usually write, but it's set in Chicago. Um, why Windy City Blues? Why did you decide to write that? You know, I didn't know much about the blues when I started. Uh, that was um, really something that my editor and I were talking. She said, you know, we wanted to do another Chicago book. All my books have been set here in Chicago. And uh, we, we started just brainstorming and she said, well, what about the blues? And I didn't know much about it, so I started researching, and it just became really apparent that it had to be about chess records. And I, the more I was digging, the more I'm like, this, we had no idea what we had stumbled upon. It's, it's really some good stuff. Well, I remember we talked right at the beginning when you were writing it, and you were searching um, for the character that ultimately became the female protagonist. Well, what okay. happened, yeah. I actually started, stopped and started the book three times. All my other books have had a, a strong female uh, main character, and I thought I would do the same with this. So I have this character, Leba, who's a Polish Jewish immigrant, um, who takes a job working at Legendary Chess Records. And so I wrote about 100 pages just from her point of view, and it was horrible. So <laughs> I trashed it. I wrote another 75 pages, just as horrible. On the third try, I got about 50 pages in, and that's when I realized that the story of the blues could not be told through one character's point of view. And I really needed to back up. I needed someone from the record industry, so I have Leonard Chess. And then I also needed a bluesman from the Delta, so I have Red Dupree, and then I have Leba. So I went back and started mm -hmm. braiding their, their stories together. Excellent. Oh, that's, that's great. So they were all from third person, close, yeah. close person. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and okay. structurally that was something really different. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, had you written any from first person? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Was what I'd done the, first, what? and uh, what the lady wants about Marshall Field was third person. Um, White Collar Girl was first person. Dollface was first person. Okay, so what I love, I, I write both first and third. What I love about first person is the intimacy mm -hmm. of the voice because you can, you really get to know your character. The reader gets to know the character, um, but it doesn't, it's not very flexible. Right. And when you need to get into other people's points of view, it can be done, but it's never been done for me with enough grace. Well, it's, it's clumsy, it's yeah, a little clumsy. You, because your character is either overhearing things, stumbling upon things, and you end up with what I call the Forrest Gump syndrome, mm -hmm. where your character is popping up in scenes that they, you know, they just feel shoehorned in. Right. Um, so, yeah. Third person, third person solves that. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, War Spies and Bobby Socks is third person. Yeah. Right. Now, what made maybe, you... No, maybe not. Wait, is it? No, yeah, it is. It is. is. No! <laughs> <laughs> 
no, I, this, that's, I, when we're done, we're done. We're writers. <laughs> we're writers, okay? When we're finished with one story, we go to another and we forget completely about the other one. Uh, that's not totally true. But um, I did something interesting with POW, which is the second story in War Spies and Bobby Socks. And I wrote it from first person, but three different characters. So okay. I put each person's name at the uh -huh. head of the chapter that was written in their voice. Now, let me ask something about voice, because when you do that, you, you have to have distinctions between mm -hmm. them. So how did you go about making each voice? Well, one was a farm girl. Um, so that was, that was easy. And then two were POWs, German POWs. One of them was a good German POW, and the other was a bad. Okay. So it was pretty easy to do, and it yeah. was a lot of fun. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. So, okay, tell us, for people who don't know or aren't familiar with Chess Records, tell us a little bit about them. Okay, so Chess Records was a record label that was started here in Chicago in 1950 by two Polish Jewish immigrants, and they had no musical abilities of their own. The brothers did not play an instrument, they didn't read music, they didn't sing, and they started a record label for the purpose of producing music by black artists. They went on to introduce not only Chicago, but the world to such greats as Muddy Waters, Holland Wolf, uh, Little Walter, Willie Dixon, Etta James, the late great Chuck Berry, um, you know, Coco Taylor, mm -hmm. uh, John Lee Hooker, it goes on and on and on. And, um, you know, they were, it was really this sort of great American story, you know, these immigrants that mm -hmm. come over. Um, and uh, you know their legacy uh, for not only blues but you know music in general, I don't think can be overemphasized. You know, Muddy Waters said the blues had a baby and they named it rock and roll. And that's very exactly. True. I was, okay, so now I'm dating myself, but I remember I used to get 45s yep. that had been produced by Chess Records and yeah. they were red. I, it must have been like sam and dave or or the isley brothers or so in the rock and roll component i was definitely yeah. a, definitely a collector so, yeah and all yeah. the music that came out of chicago is just fascinating to me you yeah. know south michigan avenue was called record row because of all the labels I, that were there the beatles first u.s single and album came out of chicago out of vj uh, frankie valley in the four seasons sherry came out of vj oh, i didn't know that um Oh my God, songs that I swore came out of Motown were out of Chicago. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, that's so it was, it was just really about. a part of our history that I had no idea. Yeah. So, so I, you said that you didn't know much about the blues. Do you count yourself a fan now? Oh my God, I'm so, I'm obsessed with the blues. Yeah. Holland Wolf, I mean, first of all, uh, this book consumed me for a year and a half. So, you know, all we did was listen to blues, drove the blues highway, you know, so met some blues musicians. Um, so it's, it's definitely, um, I, I'm just sorry that I didn't appreciate it sooner. Yeah, you know, you got to it. You finally got to it. Um, uh, my experience with the blues is that um, I edited an anthology of short stories, which you probably know, you yeah. probably remember. And, um, we had a lot of stories about the blues in that anthology, and that's when I was able to show my love for the blues. So I'm there too. Yeah. I can really get into it. Now, how did you come to write War Spies and Bobby, Bobby Socks? Socks? Well, um, you know, I've written recent history, um, the 60s, the Iranian Revolution, the Cuban Revolution. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm moving a little back and forth in time. But I've always been an avid World War II reader. I love reading about World War II. And recently, there have been so many wonderful books. I mean, there's been sort of a, a surge of, of World War II era books, Nightingale right. and All the Light You Cannot See. And then in, our, in, in the mystery genre, there's Philip Kerr and um, Alan First. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And I have some online friends where we talk about World War II books that we've read and how good they are or how bad they are. And one of my friends, who's a reader, she's not a writer, said, you really ought to write a book about World War II. I said, oh, come on. I'm not going to do that. You know, OK, I can do recent history. But number one, that's real history. And there's been so much written. What could I possibly add? And she said, well, think about it. 
I said, okay, and of course, I started to think about it and think about it, and finally, a couple of ideas came to me. And the first one that came to me was um, a story about a German refugee who came to the US before the war, got a job in the physics department at the University of Chicago, and is forced to spy on the early years of the Manhattan Project mm -hmm. before it was called the Manhattan Project. So I decided to write it, but I was still intimidated about writing mm -hmm. about that period. So I said, well, you know, I'm gonna take the chickens away. I'll write a novella rather than a novel. And that way, if it, if it crash and crashes and burns, I won't feel quite so bad. So I did write it, and it was about 30,000 words, and it turned out fine. So then I had to think of a companion novella to go with it, and I thought I was gonna write about Bletchley Park in the UK and talk about the, the women of Bletchley Park and all the, all the uh, spying that they did um, and the Enigma machine, but I couldn't quite get that to work. You know how you have to, you, you know when you've got the right story and you, you, you've got that little frisson of, of enthusiasm, and I didn't have it for Bletchley Park. So uh, I'm in exercise class one day, and I'm working out, and someone's saying, oh, well, you, you remember all those POW camp? You remember the POW camp in Skokie? And I'm like, what? <laughs> ding, the, ding, German, ding. the German POW camp? Yeah, no, what? There was a G, there was, I had no idea that there were German prisoners. I think a lot of people didn't. Well, it, it's, it's almost a forgotten piece of history now. But uh, to make a long story short, I did a lot of research found out that there were almost half a million German and Italian POWs incarcerated in the US wow. uh, between 1942 and 1945. And I ended up writing uh, a story about um, a farm girl who is uh, involved with two of those German POWs. Most of the POWs were sent out to work on farms and she meets them, and so it's a love triangle gone bad, and of course it comes back to uh, other, other things. So that was, that was two, and then I had a, a third story that takes place in Lawndale, which, as you, which is a Chicago, used to be a thriving Jewish, Jewish neighbor. neighborhood in Chicago, but um, was ground zero for the riots and really hasn't recovered since then. Um, but I did have a story about a, um, um, actress at the Yiddish Theater, so I mm. wrote that too. And it looks like we do have a question. And let's see here, this is a question for you, and it's from Janet in Magnolia, Texas. Thanks, Janet. Hi, Janet. Is it more difficult to write a historical fictional character like Leonard Chess or a completely made up, a, histo a real His, uh, character or a completely made up character? And where do you draw the line? Yeah, you know, that's a, a great question. Um, you know, there's certain things that are make it easier to write a Leonard Chess or a Marshall Field type character. Leonard Chess um, was has, had been pretty well documented. Plus, I was fortunate enough to spend time with uh, members of the Chess family that really sort of filled in the blanks for me. And so in some ways that makes it easier, but in some ways it makes it harder because you are restricted by the facts. Um, I personally like sort of balancing real, uh, actual characters with fictional characters um, because that lets me sort of flex the creative muscle a little bit. And it's more, I don't know how they're all gonna come together, I don't know how Liba's life is gonna sort of work with Leonard's. Um, and that's the part that I love about writing is you know, like you don't know what's gonna happen next to your characters. Um, so um, that's a long about way of saying that they both have their pros and cons. I actually enjoy doing both, but for me the best is to have the best of both worlds, which are some fictional characters and some uh, true life characters. Do you put words in the mouth of real characters? Oh yeah, you have to. You know, and this is where it's fiction. It's historical fiction. So I think that, you know, 
we have to bring a story to life. You have to put some meat on the bones. And sometimes you have to take creative license. And where you decide to do that is each, I think each writer has their own, like, I won't cross that line. Won't mm -hmm. cross that line. You have to be comfortable with what you're doing. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm not writing narrative nonfiction. I have friends that do that. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for, for what they do. Um, you know, and I'm still telling a story, but I always back it in the back of my books with author notes that this is right. fact and fiction. Right. And you know, that being said, I am really proud of the amount of research that I do, you know, and the accuracy. So, um, where does it start when you do the research? Does it start with the reading? Usually, but each book has been different, you know, and it's probably the same for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I always equate word count with progress. I don't know if, like, you know, I'm going to write 2,000 words a day, and, you know, you're on deadline and all. And so that's what sort of got me a little tripped up with Windy City Blues in the beginning because I didn't know the blues. I had done some sort of uh, preliminary research and, you know, trying to get those 2,000 words a day, and I realized I didn't have the foundation. And that's when I had to just put the pencil down and mm -hmm. just really uh, submerge myself in the culture and... Uh, and the Good. music and all. Yeah. So um, I remember when I was doing Chicago Blues, a friend of mine sent me a, a set, a CD set at the time of just blues. Mm -hmm. And I was right, playing it and having, dancing all over the house, and stuff like that. Um, you were saying, I, I have had, I guess the closest I've come to um, a real character was Che Guevara in Havana Lost, and I had Castro in there for a little while, but I never had them speaking. Mm -hmm. I just had the characters. It was more narrative, and then he went to see what Che was doing, and he and Che met, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So I, I haven't gone into actual dialogue. Yet. Yeah. Well, you know, if I didn't even think about not doing that. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have, but um, it no, just seemed like, um, you know, because you... you you, a story, you, you have to give a story what it needs, you know? And I mm -hmm. feel like sometimes we're just channeling the story and it, it's coming through and, um, you know. I do love it when that happens. Yeah. When, one of the pieces of research that I picked up, uh, and again, it was for POW, was, you know, I mentioned that there were half a million German POWs. Most of the POWs were former Wehrmacht soldiers. And they had been drafted, they had been conscripted, just like American soldiers. So when they uh, were captured, the war for them was over. And they were perfectly content to go uh, into a POW camp where, by the way, they were treated phenomenally well with three wonderful, you know, three meals a day. Uh, they were given jobs to do. They made $5 a week. Um, so they were treated so well not just the spirit, but the letter of the Geneva Conventions that a lot of them didn't want to go home. However, there were, there were a small minority of, of um, German POWs who had been SS or Nazis who were not giving up the ghost. And they were still fairly belligerent in the camps. And the conflict between the two, the Wehrmacht soldiers and the Nazis, was so bad that in one instance, in one camp, um, a murder occurred. And it was the Nazi killing a Wehrmacht soldier because he was the, the Nazi was convinced that the Wehrmacht soldier was spying for the Americans. Hmm. So of course, now you know what happens at POW. Yeah. Well, OK. We have a question for you. This oh. is from Dan in Highland Park. Hey, Dan. Dan says, I grew up in Glencoe, Illinois, and found out that World War II German POWs were set to work helping to drain the Skokie Lagoons between Dundee and Lake Cook Road, where the Botanic Gardens now stand. Um, there was a missile base next to the lagoons where I bicycled past many times. How many such bases were in the Chicago area? Did they really think that the Germans could reach Chicago? <laughs> Uh, good question. Um, I am aware of five POW camps in the Chicago um, area. One was right up the road from Highland Park, uh, Fort Sheridan. 
Um, another was indeed in Glenview, um, right near the Naval Air Base, and that was called the Skokie Valley Camp. Um, and those were the folks that I believe were taken off to drain the lagoons. Um, and then there, were, uh, there was one, I believe, out in Antioch or Park Ridge, somewhere in that area, and I forget where the others were. Um, and yeah, there was a missile base near Fort Sheridan, and I'm not sure, there was, a, well, there was the submarine that they found in Lake Michigan, but um, I'm not aware of any of the other missile bases. I just did research on the camp. There is a fellow that I met up with who is, uh, I guess you call him an archeologist, and his, um, his thing is to go around and find old POW camps in Illinois and then kind of do little uh, digs and see what he can find of the remnants of their lives in, during the camp. And he's, oh. got, he's got forks and spoons and plates and things like that from, from the camp. So thanks, Dan. Oh. So when you're, you've done contemporary, you've done mystery thriller, historical, do you have a favorite now that you've kind of? No. <laughs> it's really all about the story. You know, when the story comes, I, I know that it's going to be the right story. I, um, I was, you know, having, I haven't written for a while, for, since the election. Um, and, but I went through three different scenarios or plots of what I could be writing. And I got to, I got through two of them, and I said, I don't want to write this. You know, I just didn't have that, that enthusiasm. And then it came to me, the third one came to me just a few days ago, and I know it's the right one. Well, that's a good feeling. So, so finally I'm going to start writing again, and um, it's going to be a contemporary thriller. But no, I love the research involved in a historical, and I love the idea of getting into contemporary issues in the, in the contemporary thrillers. So I like them both. Um, what was it like meeting the Chess family? And also, you met Willie Dixon's daughter. Yeah, and his grandson. daughter and grandson. Yeah. What was that like? Um, yeah, I got to say, I was a nervous wreck when I first uh, met Terry Chess. I'm sitting there with, you know, I'm having lunch with Blues Royalty. Yeah. And Terry is Phil's son. And, um, you know, what happened was I was doing a, a book event. And someone said, you know, uh, came up, this was for a white collar girl, and someone came up to have a book signed and they said, you know, do you know Pam Chess? And I said, no, but I think I would like to. And she put me in touch with Pam, who's out in Tucson, and Pam is Phil's daughter. And she gave me a lot of insights into uh, her father and her uncle. And, uh, and then um, she put me in touch with Terry and uh, you know they've since become good friends. You know we often get together. They come over for dinner. We go over there, um, and uh, wonderful, wonderful people. Same with the Dixons. Um, Keith is uh, Willie Dixon's grandson. Mm -hmm. We go to Blues Heaven, which is to date the closest thing that we have Chicago has to a blues museum at 2120 South Michigan right. Avenue, which was the original Chess Studio. You take the tour, and Unbeknownst to me, the, our tour guide is Willie Dixon's grandson, Keith. And um, so I, over, while doing the research and all, um, you know, I became friendly with him and uh, we threw a big bash down at uh, 2120 when Free the book lunch. first came yeah, out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, and to have, you know, to be there with all those people and to have the Chess family and the Dixon family together, mm -hmm. you know, I'm getting goosebumps now just thinking oh. about it, so. Um, yeah, it was great. And then some of the other people I was able to interview, it was, you know, Sil Johnson, who was a big uh, soul artist. And, um, you yeah, it was really, it was a very cool thing. Yeah. We have another question for you. Okay. It's, this is from Bill, who's from the north side okay. of Chicago, I assume. I took a blues road trip, too, to Mississippi. Renee, how helpful was it to go visit the places where these artists came from? It's a different world from Chicago. It sure is. Great question, Bill. Um, we went down to New Orleans, got in a car, and drove the Blues Highway. And I don't think that I could have given this book the sort of authenticity that I hope it, it has um, without going there. 
Um, the civil rights plays a very big part in this story because you really can't disconnect the music from society and what was happening. Plus, um, you know, going into juke joints and speaking to people. I mean, we picked cotton. We did everything. We stayed in a sharecropper's shack. Um, we went up to, uh, in Memphis, we went to Stax. We went to Sun Studios, which, by the way, has a chess record exhibit in it, which tells you just how significant chess was uh, to rock and roll. Um, we went to Rock and Soul. We went to the Civil Rights Museum. And I think that's when it all kind of hit me that I was doing more than just a book about the blues. Um, and that's when you know my two fictional characters, Liba, who is a white Jewish immigrant, Polish immigrant, falls in love with Red Dupree, who's a bluesman from the Mississippi Delta. Now, they're an interracial couple in segregated Chicago in the 50s. And uh, I don't think that I could have gotten a feel for what that must have been like without you know, talking to people, definitely uh, mm -hmm. driving the blues highway, which if you ever get the chance, Teddy's Juke Joint in Zachary, Louisiana. It's oh, amazing. Cool. You, you know, continuing on with the theme of um, blacks and Jews, I know it's, it's kind of pronounced in your book. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, this really surprised me. I mean, the book could have been called Blues and Jews because <laughs> there, you know, it's blacks plus Jews equals blues. And you wouldn't have had one without the other, you know. Um, they, what, what happened was you had the blacks were migrating, um, moving north from the Deep South during the Great Migration at the same time that Eastern European Jews were emigrating from uh, Europe over to the U.S. Never put those and together yeah, before. and they they come. Many of them land in Chicago, but no one wants them here. You know, blacks were met with racism, Jews with anti-Semitism, but the one place that would have them both was Maxwell Street, an open-air market. The only color that mattered there was green. And what would happen was the Bluesman, you know, playing your guitar on your front porch is very different than being in Chicago with the L and all the congestion and the traffic, and they couldn't be heard. So they would pay the Jewish merchants down on Maxwell Street a nickel or a dime or a quarter for the use of their electricity. They'd plug in their amps, and that's where wow. we start to get that Chicago sound. Um, and, you know, Liba and Red both meet down on Maxwell Street. Um, and, you know, Leonard is in there, and it, it just, um, the whole blues and Jews, it, it's just. In your research, did you ever run across the Felds, Erwin Feld, and uh, from Washington, D.C.? Mm -mm, no. He was doing something similar. He was promoting rock, con well, rock and roll concerts um, during the early 60s, and he started out as a pharmacist. And he would put speakers outside oh, yeah. his, his pharmacy and play some of the records of the people that he hoped one day to be producing. And he did the same. It was yeah. the same kind of thing. Yeah. I wonder I mean, if he picked that up in, on Maxwell Street. I don't know, because, you know, all those musicians were down there playing. And, yeah. you know, um, it's, just, it's, an, it's a really moving story. And when you realize the roots of the blues and how it influenced every genre, that that followed, um, mm -hmm. and so much pride of what came out of Chicago. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's a really it's and a really when the cool Stones thing. would come to Chicago, the only thing they wanted to do was go jam down. Um, yeah, and you know, Keith Richards refers to twenty one twenty or Blues Heaven as hallowed ground. Um, Steven Tyler from Aerosmith went there and just wept copious amounts of mm -hmm. tears. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Clapton, The Who. Every rock star that comes through Chicago goes, pays a, you know, yeah. makes a pilgrimage to yeah. 2120. So talk a little bit about the civil rights and the fact that it was set in the 50s and 60s and how the environment helped shape the story. Well, it, it, you know, when Leba and Red fall in love, shunned by her family, she's got this Orthodox Jewish family, they only speak Yiddish at home, um, and they did not think she was going to bring a black musician home. And so she, <laughs> and, and the thing is, Red Dupree grew up in the Deep South, where he was conditioned that you don't even look at a white woman, let alone take her into your arms. 
Leba's brought up to say, you, you have to meet a nice Jewish boy. That's what, that's what you do. So both characters have a lot of internal hurdles to get past. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they also have the prejudices and, uh, of society. And um, you know, victims of a lot of hate crimes. Uh, they become uh, members of CORE, which was started here in Chicago, the Congress of Racial mm -hmm. Equality, and they become Freedom Riders. And uh, you know, basically, the, the Freedom Riders, for anybody who might not be familiar, is um, traveling for people of color in the you know 40s, 50s, and certainly before that was it was a humiliating experience. They couldn't stay at hotels. They uh, couldn't use the bathroom facilities at stops. They couldn't wait for their train or their bus. They had to be in a segregated area. Um, and so the Freedom Riders started in DC. They boarded, it was a combination of blacks and white volunteers. Some got on a Greyhound, some got on a trailways. They start in Washington, DC with the goal of we're gonna drive to New Orleans and we're gonna challenge the Jim Crow laws along the way. And uh, unfortunately, the Greyhound bus only got as far as Anniston, Alabama before it was firebombed by some Klansmen, um, a mob of them, not just some, but a mob of them. So, um, and you know, the thing is, yes, it's a historical novel, but very sadly, these themes are still with us today. Sure. You know, we're still wrestling with racism, with anti Semitism, with immigration yeah, discrimination. Thought? and Who would have thought? Yeah. Yeah, it's come back. Um, have you had any surprising reactions to the book? One of the, and it's been a, a really pleasant one, women have been writing to me or stopping me and telling me that, you know, I didn't think I was into the blues. Like, it was, just wasn't my thing. I read your book, and I've been Googling these artists, Googling <laughs> the music, and now I made my husband read it. I said, you have to read this or my boyfriend read it. So, you know, just to turn people on to the blues is, has been mm -hmm. a really cool thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and a, a book that both men and women have been able to appreciate. That's so. terrific, yeah. What about you? Um, Any a surprise lot of people, reactions? Um, no, but a lot of people don't know the history of World War II at home. I, I specifically stayed away from battles and things going on overseas and picked stories that I knew uh, reflected the home front. And you'd be surprised how little history younger generations really do know. So particularly with the POWs, they didn't know there were POWs. No one knew that, you know, the early atomic research nuclear chain reaction happened at the University of Chicago. I mean, people just, young people don't know that anymore. So, so I think the surprise and the idea that you can frame a story um, around historical events is a great way for them to think that they've had a history lesson. Mm -hmm. And I know you write about females and, and the female and female characters in my stories were pretty much the protagonists of the story. So I love to write about uh, women who feel that their options have been taken away from them hmm. and they're up against the wall. What do they do? How do they react? And in each of the three stories that I wrote, um, that happened to one extent or another. So that was fun. Yeah. Now what's, what do you find the easiest? What do you find the hardest? <laughs> I. Uh, I'm still petrified about writing. I feel so unequal to the task. I don't know if you do. I mean, I sit down and when I, particularly at the beginning of a book, I say, okay, how am I gonna pull this off? I'm They're just always know. surprised by how hard it is. The, you know, you, you finish something, it's all nice and polished and everything, yep. and then it's time to start the next right. one. And getting, it's like finding the starting point on a cellophane roll of tape, you know, you exactly. keep going round and round. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm always, just shocked at how difficult it is to get started. It, it's hard to get started, and then um, I always think that, okay, my prose is okay, but it's, it could be so much better. If I, if I just worked a little harder, maybe it would sing, maybe it would just be wonderful. And so I, I am I'm, I'm kind of hard on myself. That's the hardest mm -hmm. thing for me to do, is to actually sit down and write. The easiest thing in terms of writing for me is dialogue. Um, mm. I come from a film background, and I just have an ear for dialogue, yeah. so it's easy. And writing good dialogue is really hard. Yeah. It looks easy, but it's it looks, really hard. <laughs> it is, and I, I had to learn the difference between dialogue in a film or a TV show versus dialogue in a book, and they're how, very different. How, what's the big difference? 
Well, in, in books you have to, uh, in novels, you have to always be advancing the plot. And in uh, TV and movies, yes, you're advancing the plot, but you're also more interested in the reaction of the person to whom the talking is done because you get the reaction shots. Mm -hmm. So so there's not so much reaction in novels, but it's always move it better and never answer with a yes or no, you know, in a novel. You know, just <laughs> quit, don't use the word yes or no. It took me a couple books to learn that. So yeah. anyway, so what's next for you? Uh, I just turned in pages for my new novel. It's the first book that I'm doing that's set outside of Chicago, and it's about Helen Gurley Brown and how she resurrected Cosmopolitan Magazine in 1965. So I did not realize that Cosmopolitan Magazine had been around since the 1800s. Highly esteemed literary that. journal. Mark Twain wrote for Cosmopolitan, uh, Edith Wharton, Kipling, uh, Upton St. Clair, and uh, you know, in 62, Helen Gurley Brown wrote this groundbreaking, shocking, scandalous novel, or not even a novel, but a book called Sex and the Single Girl. Mm -hmm. And you know, all of a sudden she's gonna take over without any editorial experience, she's gonna take over you know, Cosmopolitan Magazine and half her staff quit on her and you know, she mm -hmm. was really, uh, really up against the wall. So she'd be one of your characters that you'd like to. <laughs> I would, I would, yeah. So I've, I've, I'm thinking of writing about a woman who has a political Facebook group who's murdered. And then my PI, Georgia Davis, is going to get the case. I think that sounds really... And um, she's going to find out who murdered her. And I don't know yet. So it uh, should be fun. should be fun. Well, I think maybe we're getting to the end of our conversation. Yeah. We've pretty much said what, every, what we wanted to say are, and <laughs> asked each other questions that we wanted to ask each other. Um, just to remind you... As if you don't know, we've been talking to Renee Rosen and to me, and we've been talking about Windy City Blues and War Spies and Bobby Socks. And we are very grateful that you are here with us. <laughs>